At a Sutter, California middle school, a controversy pits privacy against technology. In San Francisco, globalization is backfiring for thousands of local garment workers. And Bollywood comes to Berkeley with cow spirit and Indian spice. Good evening and welcome to CNS News. I'm Natasha Norton. In our first story, a high-tech battle is causing a divide in a small California town. Oscar Garcia has the story. Since January, roll call at Britain School in Sutter hasn't been the same. When a student walks into a classroom, an electronic sensor on the door scans an embedded chip on their ID cards. There's a, a real benefit in the future to uh, save money and time. The chips are called radio frequency identification devices, or RFIDs. Local technology firm Incom gave the school $2,500 for piloting the program. I don't know about making it more uh, Orwellian, but I think that it can be used in other areas. One gentleman contacted me from the UK who wanted to use it for his employees so he could know when they came and know when they left. But amongst students, the chips have had mixed reviews. I don't think they're cool because like they're tracking us everywhere we go and we have privacy. It's like part of our rights and stuff. Do most of the kids at the school feel the same way? Yeah, yeah, a lot, but some kids like it because they make them feel safe, but it's really not. It's just for attendance, mostly. Their parents are also divided. How can you force a new idea on a bunch of unwilling people for your profit? No, it doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're giving her blood type away or, you know, her address or anything. The controversy came to a head when in a PAC school board meeting Tuesday night, an income representative announced that the company was canceling the program. This termination is effective today. The only regret is that the school and the extension of the community will not be able to share in the future success of the system. This came as a surprise to many in attendance, including the school board itself. I understand, but I'm disappointed that we didn't have the opportunity to go through with this test to see if, in fact, this was going to give us that efficiency. Not everyone was sad to see it go, however. It's just bait for, uh, for a predator, a child molester, a kidnapper, or whatever. You know, it's, a, it's a, why is it tested here in this school? Lee Tien, a staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, was also pleased with the outcome but says electronic surveillance is bigger than one small California town. There's a lot of fear among parents within schools, and there's a lot of concern that educators have uh, for the safety of kids at school. And that's all legitimate. What concerns us is really the way that many uh, companies are seeking to exploit that fear. As long as electronic surveillance technology spreads into public buildings and streets, the debate between safety, privacy, and a digital big brother will continue. Be careful. For now, Sutter can go back to being a sleepy little town without RFIDs. This is Oscar Garcia reporting for CNS News. That controversy is dying down in Sutter, but in Berkeley you may soon see the same technology used at the public library. Opponents fear that if the library begins tracking checked out books, it won't be long before they track the people that use them. Two weeks ago, we brought you the story of the 13 Oakland schools that were failing to meet the standards of the No Child Left Behind law. Shortly after that broadcast, the decision came down. Five schools, like this one, will be restructured. The remaining eight schools will close. If a district has had, as we've had, six years to put energy into helping schools improve, and they still haven't passed even the most basic uh, benchmarks of academic success, something dramatically different has to occur. Those eight schools will become charter schools, despite opposition from the teachers union. The reality is charter schools were started to provide examples for the public schools as to how they can improve and do innovative things. But what we're seeing through the expansion of charter schools is that they're actually taking away resources from the public schools. Two non-union groups have applied to the school district to run the new charter schools. The schools will open in September when there will be 33 charter schools in Oakland. Also in Oakland, many immigrants aren't applying for food stamps. 
even though they qualify. Jordan Robertson tells us how one city is addressing the issue. Katie okay. Wong buys groceries with loose change and a tight fist. The 72-year-old retired caretaker has drained her savings on doctor's bills. Now lunch and dinner bleed together on the few dollars a day left over from her social security check. When I got my check, I paid the rent and um, medication. There's not really much left. Shoppers like Katie could be missing out on hundreds of dollars a month in free money for food. The city of Oakland recently was awarded $125,000 from the federal government to promote its food stamp program to a group that so far has shown little interest, Asian immigrants whose primary language is not English. A lot of Chinese tend to think about themselves to be, you know, that it's more desirable to be self-reliant. Self Berkeley professor Ling Shi Huang says many Asian immigrants are ashamed to take government money. If you are poor, you are eligible for it, it's, you're entitled to it. You know, and I think this whole idea is quite alien. Up to 15,000 Asians in Alameda County are eligible for food stamps, but haven't been applying for them. In fact, $46 million worth of free food went unclaimed last year in Alameda County alone. But that all started to change last week. This is part one of the application. At the first of several bilingual workshops, outreach workers signed up 15 people for food stamps. Winnie Yi is the new point person for Asian language speakers. She says many immigrants simply can't translate the application form. Everything is hard for them, so they don't want to apply for it. And now um, I tell them that I can speak Chinese, I can speak Mandarin, I can speak Cantonese, I can help you. One couple she helped was Da Yan Chin and her husband, who has cancer. They could be eligible for up to $149 worth of free food each month money they expect to receive within the next few weeks. This is Jordan Robertson for CNS News. Coming up next, crossing over the Golden Gate Bridge may soon cost you, even if you aren't driving. And while we're gone, here's proof we don't always do things right the first time. Last year in Alameda County alone. But that all started to change last week. Uh, that is on. This is on right here. It's on here. Is it up all the way? Welcome back. I'm Natasha Norton. New trade laws are putting thousands of American garment workers out of work. Timothy Wheeler goes to a San Francisco factory that may soon close its doors. For the last 18 years, the Hung Yi Sewing Factory on Mission Street has sewn clothing for companies like Jessica McClintock and Bayer. Business has shrunk, so things are really hard now. These days, owner Suk Man Young is one of the few seamstresses left in the factory. All these tables are empty. Workers used to sit in the aisles, too. We couldn't keep them anymore. I never thought that it would come to this. On January 1st, trade quotas which limited textile imports from manufacturing giants like China expired after 30 years. Without quotas, garment manufacturers are rushing to China, where production is cheaper, higher quality, and more efficient than anywhere else in the world. Nearly all of San Francisco's garment workers came from China in search of higher wages. A lot of bosses here have gone to China to open their business there, so of course there's less for us to do here. In the last year, hundreds of laid-off workers have enlisted the help of the Chinese Progressive Association. What we're trying to do is we're trying to think a couple steps ahead, to think about what are the stable job industries in San Francisco. Many of the workers okay. have enrolled in federal training programs, which offer classes in ESL, childcare, and housekeeping. They need uh, networking skills, they need um, acculturation skills, people do need training in how to hunt for jobs, how to behave at the interview, how to adjust their resumes. With jobs leaving the country, are people willing to go with them? Now we've asked some workers, so would you ever go back to China and work there in the factories? And they're like, you're crazy. Some people have. Um, and we have stories of relatives that say, oh yeah, well, I have some people go back, but they couldn't, basically couldn't survive. But for the factories here, it is a matter of survival too. 
It doesn't look good. I don't know how long I can stay open. When I have to go, I won't have a choice either. Ten years ago, there were 35,000 garment jobs in San Francisco. But layoff after layoff has left just 3,000 today. This is Timothy Wheeler for CNS News. In what some are calling an alarming bit of news about AIDS, a New York man has been diagnosed with a highly aggressive strain of the HIV virus. Some call it the super virus because no drugs are working. We don't really know based on observing this problem in one person whether this uh, is a harbinger of, of m many such patients to come or whether it's really an isolated event. This discovery is a wake-up call for those who practice high-risk behavior thinking HIV is a manageable disease. If there is a silver lining to the cloud, that that is the silver lining, that it is going to get people's attention again at least for a while uh, and, and perhaps stimulate uh, you know, people coming back to the notion of, of practicing safe sex. The scare may not be limited to New York. Health officials suspect a San Diego man has the same type of HIV. In California, 5,000 new cases of hepatitis C cost the state millions of dollars every year. Darrell Dawson visits a clinic that operates with no state funding. 55-year-old Tim McGinnis knows firsthand the effects of hepatitis C. He contracted the bloodborne disease from sharing syringes to inject drugs. I was, I was a wreck when I first I found out I had hepatitis C and I went to another doctor and they told me to go home and die. Now he counsels patients at the Oakland-based nonprofit clinic Oasis. Dr. Diana Silvestri founded the clinic, which has treated 250 patients. We treat anybody with hepatitis C, but we have a specific focus on people who have obtained it from injection drugs. They're the ones that are the least likely to have access to high-quality treatment. Hepatitis C is spread through the blood and can eventually lead to liver disease, liver cancer, and death. There is no vaccine. But about half of those treated with the costly drug interferon get better. One is Tim, who's now virus free, but he still has to deal with the side effects. I've got cirrhosis, you know, but I should have been dead a long time ago, so I feel pretty good. And I didn't feel good when I came in. I was, I was a mess. Five years ago, a bill set aside $1.5 million for different counties to fight hepatitis C. It's since expired, and the senator who proposed it left office in 2002. Earlier this month, Tim and Dr. Silvestri went to Sacramento trying to change that. You need to help people, not gel them. They petitioned for more funding to stop the disease at its root, addiction. At a press conference, Senator Wesley Chesbro expressed support. Addiction should be uh, treated like the disease that it is, just like a heart disease, just like cancer, just like diabetes. Advocates handed out pamphlets to educate legislators about hepatitis C. We're from Oasis. And victims shared their own experiences. I'm living proof that the treatment works. And all we need to do is make it available to more people and have people know about it. Back in Oakland, Tim helps victims overcome the stigmas associated with hepatitis C. I wear it like a badge of honor now because I made it. Half of us that start drugs after 30 years are dead. Treatment is free to those who need it. But without funding, the clinic may have to turn people away. This is Darrell Dawson for CNS News. While we were all hard at work this weekend, reporter Patrick Farrell went on a hike. Here's what he found. This weekend, I set off looking for something new in the woods. It was something I heard would change the way I looked at Mother Nature. So being a longtime fan, I had to see it for myself. I was just trying to get to my email, but there's no Wi-Fi here yet. Come May, though, there will be service, and plenty of it. Wi-Fi hotspots from the mountains to the marinas. It's part of a deal between SBC and the California Parks Department to bring wireless to 85 state parks. And this will really help travelers keep in touch while they're on the go. To send emails, to send pictures of their vacations, find directions, or say even pay bills. One of those bills might be paying for the service itself. Unless you're an SBC customer, you'll have to cough up $7.95 a day just to get online. Hi, how are you guys? Hi, good. Hikers I met along the trail weren't too pleased about the plan. Does that kind of negate the purpose of coming to the woods? I mean, it's a cool idea, but mm, keep it natural. 
SBC says it'll just be a matter of time before people get used to the idea. It's, it's much like uh, the first payphone being installed in the state park system. Still, this is one digital age convenience a lot of hikers said they could do without. I yeah. come here to specifically get away from things like this. You know, this is the only high technology I like to carry. Yeah. <laughs> For CNS News, this is Patrick Farrell. The Golden Gate Bridge is short on money again. Lee Wong tells us there's a controversial idea for balancing the budget. The Golden Gate Bridge. Its $5 toll makes it the most expensive span in the Bay Area. And soon, it may be more than drivers lining up to pay. Pedestrians could end up paying two, one dollar just for walking or cycling across the bridge. When I'm driving, I understand, but walking, it's gonna, you know, prevent a lot of people from doing it. People like Steve Stanko, who rides across the bridge three times a week. I think they should find creative ways to uh, uh, finance the budget shortfall without having to charge, uh, uh, charge cyclists and pedestrians. But many said they would pay simply because it's the Golden Gate. Well, as a visitor, you know, I think I'd prepare to, you know, pay something towards the bridge. You know. Brian Tarkington and Susan Williams are visiting from Sacramento. Definitely, it's worth it. You what? know, Golden Gate's, you know, historical, it's famous. Bridge authorities are trying to close a $69 million budget gap, a gap they say can no longer be covered by auto tolls alone. That means the days of free strolls may be coming to an end curtailing the best part of this bridge, says gift shop cashier Bob Burns. You know, the tourists are still going to come here, but they may not walk out on the bridges all. And, and they're going to miss something. They're going to miss something if they don't. For CNS News, this is Lee Wong. Hard to believe, but these Wee Pals are 40 years old. Coming up next, you'll meet the man who created them. To see the height, how is the height, how else where am I standing? Do -do -boo. Am I doing like a weird eyebrow thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so funny. That's ridiculous. San Franciscans are saying goodbye to one of their own this week. Moviegoers are lining up just like on any other rainy night. But for the historic Coronet Theater on Geary Boulevard, tonight is one of the last. The Coronet was scheduled to close this week, but with ticket sales still strong, the date has been pushed back to the end of the month. Okay, <laughs> you want Daiko? Yes, please. So, what are some of the great movies you've seen here? Oh, the, uh, the episode one. Star Wars? Wow, this is awesome. Though. Two months before, prior to the show, they camping outside. Really? Yeah. With over 1,200 seats, the Coronet is San Francisco's largest single screen theater, best known for running George Lucas's Star Wars films. I like all the old theaters. The ones that were have always been here from the 40s and you know and the art deco look and the single use theater so i hate to see those things change in fact the coronet is reputed to have been george lucas's favorite theater they have a uh, special uh, uh show uh pre-screening for this uh, episode one of star wars sharon stone was here robin williams uh a lot of starters uh, and why did, why did George Lucas pick the Coronet? Oh, it's his favorite theater. The Coronet is 56 years old. It was sold to the Institute of Aging, who will build senior homes there. While some movie houses are closing, a whole new industry is exploding. The B in Bollywood stands for Bombay and is the largest film industry in the world. As Aliza Nadi reports, Bollywood churns out twice as many films as Hollywood does each year. The appeal is worldwide, but the U.S. is just beginning to groove to Indian beats. Bollywood is breaking through on screen and on college campuses. That includes UC Berkeley, where the school's Bollywood dance team won first place at this year's Hindi film dance competition. Bollywood takes the film beyond the realm of reality. Um, I think that a lot of people in India want to sort of escape reality. Senior Minil Mehta is the co-captain of the team, a group that choreographs and performs dances inspired by Bollywood. South Asians take it to a whole new level. Trying to simulate that Bollywood experience. 
And what exactly is that Bollywood experience? Spectacular song and dance numbers, sprawling ensemble bits, storylines teetering on melodrama, where love, honor, and the family triumph. From early black and white to today's high tech, Bollywood is more over the top than ever. Some of the biggest stars shoot 30 films at a time. The tried and true Bollywood technique is even attracting a new audience. Kind of intoxicating in a weird, surreal way. U.S. distributor Miramax recently released the Bollywood-flavored Bride and Prejudice, starring Ashwarya Rai, the industry's reigning princess. I really like Amitabh Bachchan, who's sort of the Sean Connery yeah. slash Marlon Brando. Amitabh Bachchan, Bollywood's quintessential bad guy, is the main draw for David Boyk, okay. who runs a web page called Bollywood for the Skeptical. I wanted to convince other people that Bollywood is great because everybody thinks it sucks. In fact, the website he began as a hobby has gotten over 10,000 hits after just a couple of months. <laughs> Bollywood cinema has even become an academic pursuit. Berkeley professor Priya Joshi teaches courses on Bollywood movies to sometimes skeptical students. Within the third film, they were weeping, they were hooked, and it was, it was like they had completely submitted and they had no resistance. It, it was like they had been washed away by a flood. Fascinating, since there's no nudity, sex, or even kissing in Bollywood films. Times are changing, but there's a certain kind of... Uh, I don't want to call it prudery, but a certain fantasy that the cinema should still be a family space. One of the richest Americans are America. buying into the fantasy. Bride and Prejudice earned five times more in its opening weekend than its mega-hit cousin, Monsoon Wedding. It may be a sign that Hollywood is finally ready for Bollywood. For CNS News, I'm Eliza Nadi. One of Mexico's most famous playwrights is urging Berkeley students to express their lives through theater. Amelia Pablo takes in a performance. Viva Mexico! Viva! Six hours a week for the past month, these UC Berkeley students met to learn the craft of theater from renowned Mexican playwright Sabina Berman. I want to learn about the bicultural experience. And I designed something in which I could be sure that they were going to learn something useful for them. But we could all learn about uh, being Hispanic and American. Berman, a daughter of Jewish immigrants in largely Catholic Mexico, was interested in getting a glimpse of how Latinos in the U.S. deal with their own clash of cultures. They chose co uh, conflicts that have to do with being bicultural. But I don't think they, they chose cliché conflicts. She asked her students, most of them Latinos, to write their own stories, and on the last day of class, they read their plays. I never said I was Mexican. My dad is, but he stopped being my father when I came out to him. I am a gay American, and that, Nancy, is my ethnicity. Danny Seguro wrote a story about two women conflicted about their sexual identity and their Mexican heritage. Nancy, wait. I think you came here for someone else besides Nacho. Another student wrote about police brutality and religious oppression in South Central LA. So what's your plan? Rally the people, empower them to see the truth. Stop this violence, stop this system. Theater for me has really provided, provided like that outlet for creativity, for kind of other stuff that, that we have to push you know, under, that we have to like, that repress. You know, like all the racism, all the hate that we get. At the same time, you know, the love that, you know, we can't express because of the machismo culture. For Berman, whose own work explores themes on gender, politics, and national identity, theater is a necessity. Freedom resides in taking your mascara away and resting for a while. That, that's the moment when you're really free. Then you have to choose another one and put it on, but you can choose. And that's what is, I think that's the great teaching of theater. Black History Month is a time to reflect on the contributions of African Americans. Tracy Curry reports on one who's been making black history in his own way for 40 years. In 1965, 
These black and white images of race-related violence seared across American television screens. But during that same year, you? a former GI from Oakton Good. created a more hopeful future with his own set of black and white pictures. Maury Turner put yeah. pen to paper and gave life to Wee Pals and its integrated cast of comic strip kids. When I started it, it was, a, it was an all-black strip. Now, I had been complaining that the comics of that day were all white. In order to, to stop complaining about non-people of color in daily newspapers, I decided maybe I'd better do the same thing. I'd integrate it in my strip. When Wee Pals was picked up by a San Francisco syndicate, Maury became the first African-American cartoonist to have a syndicated comic strip. Through the Wee Pals, Maury promoted his message of tolerance and encouraged kids to choose school instead of the streets. Some of the things I said are, e are easily accepted in the, from the mouths of, of children. Late cartoonist Charles Schultz was one of Maury's longtime friends. Maury found inspiration in Schultz's Peanuts characters. They look so simple, the drawing, but they're very intricate. Maury recently received honors for his 40-year career in a ceremony at the Charles Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa. And I thought that Maury should be uh, rewarded for his diligence and the message of peace and brotherhood that he's always put forth in his comic strip. Maury's fans, young and old, continue to follow the Wee Pals message of cross-racial camaraderie. Maury's example has inspired a new generation of comic strippers to make their own mark on the funny pages. Maintaining is the three-year-old creation of Nashville cartoonist Nate Creekmore. Maury Turner is the guy that opened a lot of doors for me to even be able to be here right now. Mm -hmm. You know, if he hadn't been in the business, I definitely wouldn't be allowed to do the kind of things that I'm going to be doing as when I get syndicated. Mm -hmm. Not that Maury's planning on retiring anytime soon. At age 81, he recently launched his newest strip, Super Sisters. Here, the whole Wee Pals gang shows up to celebrate the achievements of prominent black women in history. I, I'm excited about what I do, and I'm beginning to get it right. <laughs> this is Tracy Curry for CNS News. That's CNS News for tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll be back in three weeks. I'm Natasha Norton. Good night. This is the last, this is the last mouthful. Time. A whole new. It's a whole new.